Welcome to the Rational Egoists. I'm your host, Michael Leibowitz. With the recent assassination attempt of former President Donald Trump came the now, I guess it's already an iconic conic image of him with his hand raised, fist clenched above his head, blood on his face. And I've even heard people say that now that this has happened, they're going to vote for him. So I recently read an article in Reason Magazine about the power of political images and why it's a mistake to lend such credence to them. The author of that article is here with us today. He's Crispin Sartwell. He formerly taught philosophy at Dickinson College in Carlisle, Pennsylvania, and his latest book is Beauty, A Quick Immersion. Crispin Sartwell, welcome to the show. Uh, good to be with you, Michael. Fascinating topic. Well, images of military and political nature have a long history, probably as old as the human race, but specifically in regards to the United States, what are some of the more iconic images that people may be familiar with? Yeah, and I think this one is somewhat different than most of them, as I've been thinking about the history of this, uh, which is not really primarily the lens I used in reason, say. Well, how about the Obama Hope poster? Uh, I mean, that kind of focused a lot of uh, feelings one way or another, I guess. Uh, or, you know, Washington crossing the Delaware. That was uh, almost a century maybe after the event, but it had some kind of meaning for maybe the Union or something like that. Um, you know, I guess there's there are things like the Statue of Liberty. I mean, if we're going to talk about icons, um, now this is a different kind of image, though, in this sense that it's not uh, a concerted, intentional piece of propaganda, right? It was it was snapped by an AP photographer. You know, it's not an attempt to. It's not, in its initial appearance, an attempt to manipulate the electorate or whatever, or to right. create airsats inspiration. It's an attempt to document the actual events, but it had a remarkable quality to it. I, I'm going to admit that. Why do images, in your view, have such a powerful impact on us? Like the, the Washington cross in the Delaware, I mean, that type of image inspires emotion. Why? Yeah, right now, Biden is being compared to Washington, right? In virtue of <laughs> withdrawing. Yeah. Yeah, he went from a uh, uh, he went to he went he got to be George Washington real quick, actually, uh, by withdrawing. Um, well, I mean, I, I'd say, like, I guess even my dissertation was about this. Uh, the effect of images is quite different than the effect of words, for example. That's the sure. way I would think about it. You know, yeah, these are two media of propaganda and they can have different they can have similar emotive effects. Um, or perhaps, but the images are more immediate and visceral, I think, than texts anyway. Uh, you know, so, you know, in a way you don't have to, well, you don't even have to be a competent speaker of any particular language to understand an image or to see what it's an image of. It has an, you know, it has maybe an immediate actual resemblance to what it depicts that makes the act of interpretation quicker or even involuntary, right? It's not like you, I can look at a picture of a human being and not know that it depicts a human being, you know, uh, but it might take me a while to decode a description. And, I, and, and for whatever reason, I might feel like I know the person if by really seeing an image of them in a way that I wouldn't feel like I did by hearing a couple sentences about them or whatever, you know? So I'm not sure. I mean, psycho psychologically, it's interesting, like the difference between image and text in how it affects an audience is uh, pretty dramatic, I think. Sure. Well, when like if I'm reading a book, for instance... I have to visualize what's taking place in the book, but an image is present immediately before the human mind. And I, I, if I had a guess, I would say that is probably the case. 
that it just it because it's so vivid and so salient it, it evokes those emotions now what is it do you think about this particular photograph that is so i don't want to say powerful powerful is what i have in mind but it doesn't even seem adequate that's so evocative uh, i mean you've got baseball players now you know running the bases and putting their hands up in the air saying fight so what yeah. what is it about it well, I mean, we could talk about the details of aspects of the image in a way like the, uh, there isn't there's a number of images right uh, uh, of this event. Uh, it tends to narrow down to a couple that are beautifully composed or whatever, somehow, just by uh, coincidence in a way, maybe they are like get into a nice triangular, almost Renaissance composition. I'd say that's true of the image we're discussing. I think like it basically breaks down into a nice triangle, I suppose. Um, all right. So, I mean, I think the direct, the, the, like the direct resemblance of a picture of Trump to Trump kind of short circuits the interpretive machinery. Like it's, it, it's almost like you can confuse the image with the person or whatever it's the Im image of almost effortlessly or you almost have to withdraw for a second to understand that you're only seeing an image you know i think we often sort of treat images irrationally uh i mean again like if i were if i had a picture of someone you loved here and i ripped it in half you know maybe with a little nasty expression or something like that you would find you know like it's it's not that we have a voodoo theory of images, you and I probably, you know what I mean? It's not mm -hmm. that we have a magical theory of images that you can control people by controlling pictures of them or dolls or something. But we probably do have like an immediate visceral response at times to an image as though we are seeing what it's an image of, you know? And we talk about it that way too. Like I saw, I, I said, I, I would say things like this. I saw Trump get shot. I just watched that on TV, right? Like, I don't say I looked at a screen and saw some pixels in a, yeah. in a certain design. I say, I saw Trump get shot. You know, that's it has an immediacy that is a little hard to deal with in a way, cognitively. A friend of mine went to school uh, and got his master's in visual arts. And uh, he and I were talking, this is decades ago, but we, we had a conversation about it. And he said that often if not always, the explanation attached to the art is just as important, if not more important than the piece itself. Now, in the case of Trump, we we know it's not just a picture of some guy with his hand up and blood on his face. We all know that, this, that somebody tried to take his life. That's powerful to me in and of itself. He escaped assassination. But then there's this sort of religious yes. imagery and, and significance attached to this. There's people, but it's all over the place. They're in the convention. God spared him. And it's yes. almost like the, you know, the risen Christ as he gets up and puts his, his hand up and people say he took a bullet for the country, which clearly isn't true. He, I mean, this, there, there's no uh, indication that this guy was even politically motivated. It, it, Trump certainly didn't intend to take a, a bullet. And, but nonetheless, we have this story being told that this is a guy who took a bullet for us so it's almost like you know jesus yes. on the cross dying for our sins and I, I just wonder how much of an impact the first of all the knowledge of what the, the bare facts of the situation are but along with the additional stories that are told about this this is a guy who's been attacked over and over again by his enemies but continues to rise that sort of thing and that's got to give additional life to the image as the image gives additional life to the, all those uh narratives that's really well put i think yeah uh and you know and and right it makes all the difference how trump was being interpreted before that image occurred for many years now and by his supporters who have sort of at times cultivated a kind of supernatural aura around him or something like this. I found that I, I must say like the most absurd thing I ever heard, like about this guy, 
right? Like uh, who just struck me as such a buffoon or whatever. Although maybe my impression has changed a little bit since that event, uh, just a little bit. So that's a little strange and disturbing for me. Um, or, but his enemies too, like never Trump Republicans in particular, like someone like Liz Cheney, let's say, or somebody like that. Like he, I mean, people use terms like satanic all the time before yeah. that. Yeah. Uh, and they kind of, even, you know, just before this, they were, or as this happened, people were saying like, Democrats are going like, we will inevitably lose this election. Like, there's no way to beat Trump. Now we're, and it, it, it's kind of like he's taken on the supernatural aura, which then got triple confirmed uh, in, in, in those images in some way. You know, his enemies in particular treat him as more than a human. You know, and I think that that and so then, I mean, I was shocked, as I said in the reason piece, that people like Ross Doutat or at the, the columnist from New York Times or uh, Jonathan Jones, the art critic in The Guardian. These are not Trump people, but they had a religious an ecstatic religious response to that image. And they wrote about it the next day. Um, and so. I guess like I start to try to wonder like how, what was happening with Jonathan Jones? So first of all, he, I mean, he's an art critic. He's very sensitive to imagery, right? That's probably how he got into that. He's yeah. a good art critic too. I always thought, you know, actually, um, but somehow his mind switched from, you know, like this is a satanic force of evil destroying, perhaps destroying the world. He must be stopped to, this is Christ risen. He said that. Like, oh he, my he God. said that, you know, you know like, and, you know, Doubtad is, this is an extraordinary person, a man of destiny, a great man of history, like a Hegel would say and stuff like that. Like, dude, all right, like, take a deep breath, man. Like, you went way around way too quick. And I am interested in how that happened. Like, what happened that night? You know, they probably yeah. return back to a more uh, yeah. See, considered position on this. But, you know, what I find interesting about that is had you asked me beforehand how I would react, if you gave me the exact scenario and asked me how I reacted, I would have predicted I've reacted pretty much how I have. My guess is, though, that those guys, had you asked them, they wouldn't have predicted that they'd respond in that way. And I find that absolutely fascinating. I've never, yeah. Trump to me is a carnival barker. Like, like Chris Christie said, he's a very, very good marketer. Um, he knows he, he's a poor communicator generally, but he knows how to communicate directly to the emotions of the people that follow him. Uh, I don't take that away. I was a little surprised at his, you know, determination to stand right up. I wouldn't have expected yeah. him to do that. Yes. Um, I do find that a little bit impressive. I don't know how much of that was deliberate on his part to create the image or if it was spontaneous. For all I know, he's gone over scenarios. If somebody ever shoots at me, I'm going to raise my hand above. I mean, I don't <laughs> know. Ultimately, wow. I know that it doesn't have the same impact on me uh, in far as courage or anything else. First of all, he didn't get shot. He, he got nicked grazed in the air. I know plenty of people that have gotten shot. And I promise if you, anyone talks to people that have been shot in the face, like Tucker Carlson says, they don't look at Donald Trump as having been shot. I have a good friend of mine who's been shot six times. And he said he was great. Okay. Let's be honest. You know, he was great. There's plenty of yeah. people, kids in the inner city in gang wars that get shot at, rise up, shoot back. And, you know, no one treats them as, as if they're heroes. You know, it, it, so while I, I say, yes, it's, you know, there, there was an element of courage shown. It wasn't superhuman. Y you know right. what I mean? And, and that, but that's yeah. how it's portrayed. I, I think more, more than pain, I think fear, the fact that, you know, someone just tried to kill you, I think would be greater than the pain of the, the nick of the year. Yeah. But and the it, shock and the fact that yeah. the whole Secret Service kind of landed on you. Yeah, that, uh, I mean, to, for him to have so the presence I, I was of mind impressed was by that. impressive. Me too. Me too. Yeah. It's impressive, but it's not throwing me off my my rocker. Yeah. 
I was completely like, okay. <laughs> That's good, man. Yeah. No, <laughs> Don't it, let it, you know. No, I, uh, I won't. But it's it's it, to be yeah. honest with you, I mean, it, it's off track from the image. But the whole Trump phenomenon from the beginning and, and now it, it baffles me. And not in a sense of I don't get why people like him, but I more deeply than that, he plainly lies and it's crystal clear. And someone people will say to me, for instance, oh, you're believing the mainstream media. No, I'm comparing two statements he's made, one where he said one thing mm -hmm. and another where he said another thing. I don't need the media to tell me I'm not trusting of the media. I'm a libertarian politically, but I've supported every Republican since I've been following politics until Trump. So I'm not some left-wing nut. My criticisms of Trump are largely from the his anti-constitutionalism, his anti-capitalism. But the, his followers just say, "No, no, you're a leftist. You're you're not. You're just uh, you have Trump derangement syndrome, and you're you're not uh, falling. You you you're falling for bullshit from the other side." And then accuse me of gaslighting. And the reality is, they're the ones that are gaslighting. Like I've actually stopped and questioned myself. Like, what am I missing? What do I get? But in this image is just like an encapsulation of all that. It's just not that significant to me. He's still an asshole. He was an asshole before. Yes. He's an asshole now. He showed some grit in standing up. But I know a lot of assholes who have grit, right? right. He didn't change any policies. No. Uh, he didn't change his personality. No, uh, nothing. I mean, Jonathan, Jonathan Jones in The Guardian actually seems to say that and he has to attribute this kind of intuitive genius to him that th he did that all as an as an intentional image making event. But I don't think you can do that. All right. Like, I don't think you can get nicked with a bullet. The Secret Service lands on you. You stand up, you know, and now you're thinking, like, how will the pictures look? I, I think it's too quick. I think it's so I, I was I was impressed by that. Now, you know, I, the Trump phenomenon. I, I'm not sure what to make of it in, in many ways. One thing I think we're seeing, like a, someone who has libertarian tendencies would, would see this pretty quick, is the, just a, a complete shift in what right wing might mean. Yeah. Right. Like now it's nationalist. Right. It has no libertarian element whatsoever. Right. Like it's not. I mean, sometimes he'll wave at tax cuts or whatever, uh, I suppose. You know, that's about as close as you get. Um, but it's not like minimal statist. It's not uh, it, just the opposite. Yeah. You know, he wants a, a very large, very active government, you know, and that's like how we explain why this moment is that moment where the whole right wing kind of and also kind of takes over maybe national politics um, shifts from. I don't know what, like whatever Paul Ryan was selling, I guess, uh, to uh, just like jingoistic nationalism. And, you know, I, you know, I guess, but it's you know, dramatic. I mean, so many people have, have had so much trouble, surely, with the transformation. I mean, what's happened to Marco Rubio or, you know what I mean? Like the way he talked sure. 10 years ago and the way he talks now, it's like, anyway. But well, yeah, it's it's well, a little puzzling. Well, part of the the problem, I mean, like you said, like the, some of the language, J.D. Vance said something that could have come right out the Communist Manifesto. What you know, when he says we're no longer for the for Wall Street, we're for the working man. I, I mean, that's not language you're used to hearing at a, at a Republican convention. Part of the problem, no. though, in assessing things is there's no way to tell when you're dealing with politics and how much of it's just opportunism. Where people see this is the Trump train, let's get on it because otherwise we're going to quickly end up in you know irrelevancy. And I saw that early on during the primary with some of the talk show hosts, you know, Rush Limbaugh, Sean Hannity. When when Trump was talking about things that were so diametrically opposed to what they had been saying for years, and they just gave it up and jumped right in with Trump, and then started yeah. defending him when like on things that they would never would have defended somebody else to me that's opportunism but I, I was listening to ezra klein today and he was talking about how people have a difficulty maintaining cognitive dissonance so there's a very yeah. real possibility that it, what starts off as opportunism ends up in 
really buying into the the whole I, I don't know dynamic. I think you start persuading yourself uh, eventually. Although, boy, I think we've seen some horrendous opportunism, just like unbelievable hypocrisy, uh, where you just shift to your opposite <laughs> almost overnight. Like, come on. Like, mm -hmm. now, I, now I dismiss you from then on. OK, like, uh, but um, OK, but like J.D. Vance might be an example of like something that's more of a conversion experience. Like, I don't really even know where his politics were when he was at Yale. I mean, I, people probably do know that, but I don't know that, uh, you know, but um, I can't imagine that he was a sort of person who immediately gravitated toward Trump and the Trump persona, you know, just and just felt immediate attraction to that. But I think that as he started to. I mean, I think it had a lot to do with actual policies, actually, in the, that case, like the protectionist stuff. Um, you know, the, you know, people talk about bringing back American manufacturing for decades and pursued policies that did just the opposite, you know, and, and pretty soon someone like Vance is feeling pretty fundamental beliefs of his about middle America and the economy into the context of the American America first rhetoric uh, or, you know, even his own Appalachian roots now, maybe he hears it as a little more racial than he once did. Now he thinks of it in terms of immigration, it connects protectionism and immigration and the economy of Middletown, Ohio, where he's speaking right now, I think, his hometown, uh, and he can get on board. You know, he's trying to convince himself of different aspects of Trump's platform. And I think like he probably has a rational route from here to there, sort of, that's also in his self-interest for his ambitions. But a lot of people do not, I think, have like any kind of sincere story about how they transformed into MAGA from where they, from, like I say, sort of Paul Ryan or Mitt Romney Republicans or whatever, you know? Sure. And the basic message, I mean, Pat Buchanan embodied this message long ago. So it was latent within the Republican Party, just not dominant, but now it's all there is. And what I find, like, it's, it's a very strange thing to me because they don't say, that at least the people I interact with, we yes, we're done with the you know the co or constitutional originalism. We're done with the capitalism. They claim that Trump is actually the defender of the Constitution. He's the anti-Marxist. He's the capitalist defender, and it doesn't matter what evidence you show them. They they, they uphold it over and how over. Do, how again. do you see? It? Why do you see him being anti-capitalist? That's why interesting, do, right? Why like, do I uh, see him being anti-capitalist? Yeah. Yeah, yeah. Well, well, he's pro entitlement. He's pro tariff. He's a deficit spender. He's for handouts, and he's pressured the Federal Reserve. Okay, to, and you know monetary expansion. He wanted to use that. He's pro the Kilo decision here in Connecticut, where I live, where they ruled that eminent domain goes to taking private property for private use as well. I mean, I would argue oh, yeah, yeah. eminent domain in and of itself, even when interpreted properly, is anti-capitalist. So, it, well, that's it, ambivalent, I guess. Yeah, there's maybe very, right. It could be pro-capitalist in its effects, I guess. Well, not if uh, capitalism but, is thought of as the now, free, as a free market where individuals are allowed the freedom of contract, the freedom to choose, the individual rights are protected. It's certainly not, and that's definitely not Trump. I mean, this is the paid family leave president. You know what I mean? So. I, I yeah. but they defend them. They say no. He was a brilliant businessman, which clearly isn't the case. He he, he exploited <laughs> bankruptcy <laughs> laws, went bankrupt numerous times, the, relied on bailouts, was in bed with the government. But nonetheless, they, they there's a narrative that goes with him that you, they just will not shake. And I think that well, back, I, you know, I bring think, it back. Yeah. Just one second to bring it back to the image. Yeah. 
I think that the image, it, it's a similar thing. It's this is the heroic Trump, the persecuted Trump rising like the like a phoenix from the ashes who's they've attempted to kill him. And now he's got his hand in the air where the, the narrative doesn't fit the reality, but it doesn't matter. How many of them have said they tried to kill him? They, 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 as if it's this big conspiracy and not just Mark David Chapman you know, killing Lennon because he's red catcher in the rye. You know, it's that's mm -hmm. to me what it likely is. And it, what little evidence we have seems to support it. But go ahead. Yeah, well, uh, let's see. I had about seven ideas that I've uh, now misplaced, I guess. Oh, no. But uh, <laughs> Sorry. That's, that's my habit these days. Um, but I mean, I guess I was going to say that I just for the heck of it, that I think Trump and capitalism is an ambiguous matter. OK, definitely not like free trade neoliberalism or however we were thinking about capitalism back uh, 20 years ago, you know, or world capitalism. But by the same token, lots of businessmen and business people in the U.S., I think, are pretty enthused about Trump because he you know, oh, he, sure. he can be very good for U.S. businesses. Right. And if he's you know, so if he's I mean, the reason he's threatening tariffs or whatever is to and he man, he's he, they he's changed Democratic policies too. Biden just mm -hmm. wants to put just slapped 100 percent tariffs on Chinese uh, <laughs> EVs. Yeah. All right. Because because Trump put him up to it, man, like he's trying to run against Trump. Um but anyway, so I, but I'm not necessarily that interested in trying to sort out Trump and capitalism. But yeah, it's really, it is the attraction of the personality, which maybe we don't feel so heavily, uh, and the attraction and the mastery of the imagery, and and certain mastery of some ret rhetorical moves, although he's loose and baggy all the time, uh, has. It, I, I, I guess it's had a quite a seductive effect, you know, I mean, I don't want to sound like just a cliche, but, you know, it's, it's a pretty author, it's pretty effective application of lots of things in the authoritarian playbook. It's a little hard to tell how um, conscious it is. It It's consistently has an effect. It consistently, he does it in a way that, beefs up his situation or whatever but it, it, to me he doesn't seem like a diabolical authoritarian manipulating images and words in this hyper conscious way he's a lot more improvisational a lot looser i don't know man but uh i i'm certainly worried that we're headed i mean like a lot of people i guess on different sides i'm, I'm worried we're heading down an authoritarian road here it certainly seems just the reaction to that image. Well, yeah, just... that is actually what I was going to ask you next. Is I'm it's pre uh, it, you preempted my question in a sense because I was going to ask if it's a mistake to put so much <laughs> credence into the image, but so I, I I know your answer to that. But what are some of the dangers of attaching such importance to this particular image or images in general, for that matter? Well, maybe I could. I mean, I, I think images really do have a uh, a central role in many authoritarian regimes and stuff like this, uh, obviously, and in authoritarian history. Like if we th were thinking about totalitarianism, um, and if I wanted to convey what totalitarianism, totalitarianism has been in the last couple hundred years, I might do it with a series of images of dictators looming over Beijing or uh, Baghdad, et cetera, you know. Um, now, on the other hand, though, images, like, I guess, like a lot of things, but uh, I, images are also fragile as hell, okay? You can, you, it, it might, you might lead to a, a cult, but Next week, we might be burning that th sucker, okay? Next week, we'll be smashing it. Like, idolatry and icon iconoclasm go together all the time. And we the power of images, it seems kind of supernatural or something like this, 
but they're liable to be made of paper or pixels that can be destroyed, blown up, rendered into a parody, whatever. Like, I don't know if you've seen uh, Elon Musk today on X. No, I didn't. Uh, has been circulating. Yeah, he, 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 today he's been circulating a fashion show of world leaders. So uh, Xi Jinping comes by in a, in a wild set of pajamas carrying a purse, you know, like maybe with cartoon character pajamas. And Hillary Clinton walks in, you know, and she's boogieing Barack Obama. Biden walks in with a nice like, I don't know, like a uh, uh, Bill Clinton is wearing an evening gown. Uh, all right. So now. So actually, I found myself absorbed by those images, even though I try to resist Elon Musk's uh, uh, feeds and shit like this. But I'm going like, damn, that's cool. Like that's that's like sort of like a Daumier or a, you know, a parody. Like images can be used for subversive purposes, too. Sure. Right. I don't want to just say like these, you know, that, that that's they're dangerous inherently. Um, they have. You know, they can definitely have they have oppressive capacities and kind of self-oppressive capacities, like where you sort of involuntarily respond. But they also have um, but they don't have supernatural powers and they can be destroyed easily or altered at will, especially now. You know, so Xi Jinping in colorful pajamas and a purse. It's like, damn, all right, man, I feel better about the whole world now, you know, or whatever. <laughs> You know, it, it, uh, it just occurred to me in talking about the power of images. I used to watch this show years ago called Rain, and it was uh, about Mary, Queen of Scots, and her largely her time in France. And it was not anywhere near historically accurate, but I used to watch the show, and it was a good show. And there was an episode. Now, I am not pro monarchy or pro, uh, you know, jingoism or, or any of that stuff, but there was a, a scene where her all the you know the military leaders of Scotland or the the main ones were going to turn on her and they went to France to see her and she, I don't remember what but she did something courageous and there was this scene where they all you know sheathed their swords and bowed down to her and I remember just like goosebumps it was so powerful and I'm and then after I'm thinking I don't even believe in it like this is horrible but nonetheless the the imagery is just so strong and I could see how if one doesn't combat it and say, wait a second, you know, I, I, that's not what, what I'm into, how it can be so powerful. And I, I wonder when you say that it's shattered easily, how, like, how do you <laughs> capture that sort of thing? Do, I mean, I, I, maybe you don't know, but how, you've just seen it happen, but take a, a guess, <laughs> I guess is what I want you to do. Wow. That's a good question. Like, so what could we do to that image to take away its power uh, or something like that? Or I, I don't I, know let me we... just say, I suspect with Trump, it's going to be more difficult. And the reason is part of the uh, reason that it doesn't have such sway over me is because I see it. And while it's powerful, I immediately tell myself, okay, he's still the same Trump. This is still the same guy who's mocked handicapped people, said horrible things about women, about John McCain, whose policies I don't agree with, who I've seen lying a million times. So I already have these defenses up when I see that image. But if I'm already yeah. either on the fence or I'm already a devout Trumpster and I see that image, breaking yeah. that I think is not an easy task at all. You might be right. And, you know, I feel the same thing. And I s hate to admit this so much in myself uh, because I feel like such a knee jerk anti authoritarian. And I'm proud of that from a small child. But like I remember like sort of like being totally into the tales of King Arthur. <laughs> yeah. You know, the once and future king, the the person that brought the whole country together and all these people bowed down and and pledged their troth. And, you know, then the country exploded and everything went wrong, but he's going to come back and fix it. You know what I mean? And like, like that captured my imagination as a child. I, I don't know how to stop looking for a redeemer. I don't expect one from our species, though, right? Mm -hmm. uh, and, 
you know, but this is the way, but you can make someone into a redeemer in an image. And, but I, but I, I really wonder what's going to happen now when, you know, what, if Elon Musk can turn Xi Jinping into a runway model, just by probably asking, um, you know, what, what happens to the power of images when they're so immediately, easily, continuously alterable? But uh, but this but the Trump thing is a counterexample to that. I guess uh, this, these are my thoughts. Is like I would have probably said the th power of images was beginning to melt in a way because images are melting. You can do anything to them. You can put anyone's head on it. You can do, you know, it doesn't it doesn't convey truth in the way it did, maybe, or it doesn't. You're, maybe we're getting more critical about them. We should be, but that the Trump image, I and it's it's not going to be easy. It's not going to be a matter of simply defacing it, right, or throwing a graffiti on it. Although I would try that, maybe. Uh. <laughs> See, I'm yeah. actually I'm uh. afraid it's just the opposite. I'm afraid that going forward, it's going to be very difficult for anybody to criticize him that's because if there's this sort of deification of him and they've already started to blame the rhetoric you know of the left for why he got shot completely dismissing the, their own rhetoric you know throughout the years and i agree there's a lot of silly rhetoric on both sides i don't know mm -hmm. i don't think it had anything to do with him getting shot but nevertheless but it, it's almost as if now he's impregnable against that type of stuff because anytime someone tries to criticize him, you're going to see there they go again. They're they're putting his life at danger, you know, at risk. That type of rhetoric led to this before. We can't have that now. And that kind of scares me. Because I don't think anybody's, you know, should be above criticism or, or beyond reproach. Yeah, man. And that and this is interesting. I guess if we're talking about the power of images, we should talk about what the power of words. What's been happening with the power of words? Sure. Uh, this is the other thing I've been writing about this whole event is that, I mean, the left used to say this all the time. Like if you use the wrong word, that's violence, right? Or mm -hmm. I mean, they would say that, that that causes violence. So that's that's central to oppression. And then they started saying, like on college campuses and stuff, that is violence when you yeah. uh, use a bad word or, you know, say the wrong or misgender uh, somebody or whatever. Um verbally uh and and then the right got swept totally up in that in a way gleefully and self-consciously after the trump shooting right sure. uh yeah so breitbart was um you know they they quoted bet midler you know <laughs> he must be stopped at all costs or something you know what i mean like okay all right wait yeah, I see you're ironically playing with the idea that Bette Midler is to blame for the assassination at, because you're the left used to do shit like that last week. Yeah. Um, well, you know, or but then some of them seem much more, you know, Biden, quote, we're going to put Trump in the bullseye. OK, uh, you know, or fight, fight, fight. Everyone says fight all the time, I guess, you know, um, but uh so, I, I mean, I'm skeptical there, too. I guess we should really think about whether those are different kinds of powers, the power of a word to set you off or the power of a image to set you off. And then, like, what kind of responsibility do you bear for throwing those words or those images out there or something like that, you know, or. Sure. And, and it, yeah. you know, a lot ah. of it depends on the. On are you using words metaphorically are they easily misinterpreted who's the target audience how i mean i could say something and nobody really cares <laughs> you know i could i get on here and say fight 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 yeah whatever asshole i'm going to work <laughs> you know trump says it at a speech though where he's got people already predisposed to thinking an election was stolen from him and you know they're all wound up already he's been persecuted and he says it well now it has different meaning in a, yeah. a different context than if I say it to you on a podcast. And I, and it, so it's a very difficult thing to evaluate because I hate the whole like microaggressions and words or violence. But at the same time, I think people in power should speak responsibly. And you're not like I, I think the whole idea Trump is Hitler or Bush was Hitler or Obama was Hitler or there are, 
you know, calling people that are big government liberals, they're communists. It's just. When yeah, it's well, used, that's true. When it's used just as, a you know, for a hyperbole and it's known, I get it. But then it seems to morph from the hyperbole to believing the actual thing. Like Marxist now seems to be like an insult. And what I mean by an insult, yeah. it's not an insult that has any meaning any longer. Whatever somebody doesn't like now, they label, oh, that's Marxist. That's Marxist. It's like just calling sure. somebody an asshole. Well, what exactly do you mean by the term? You know, yeah. it, it, it just means whatever you want it to mean when you don't like someone. And that, yeah, that's taken a, I get, and, and the thing, the picture, it's symbolism, language is, of course, symbolism as well. And it's just the, the, I guess the symbols have taken on a great meaning. The symbolic aspect of imagery, of words, seems to have been almost reified to the point where, like you said earlier, people yeah. take the picture for the actual thing. Yeah, I mean, I, I, another example going back to pictures, I guess, is just the week before Trump was shot, the New Republic had a cover of Trump with a Hitler mustache. Yeah. You know, I mean, that's what you're saying. It's like, and I, I, I mean, it's true. Like, if you then thought to yourself, well, it would have been better if Hitler had been killed. Yeah. It, so, it, like, if you, to believe if, you're just, if you just, yeah, if you just accept the identification, that has been relentless, actually. But now this picture is very compelling, too. It was a very compelling photo montage of Hitler and Trump. Um, yeah, I mean, I, I. but yes, one thing I would really like try to urge everybody is like. Don't mistake pictures and words for reality, man. Like, I don't know how we're going to make it through this world if we do, because everyone's trying to get us to change our reality with a few terms or you know just throw us a picture that will make us kill 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 or something like that like yeah. you, you couldn't get through this world without having some critical leverage on words and images and right now it's really important like to just go like what am i seeing and what am i feeling and is this, uh, maybe I'll stop for a second and think about that, you know, but sure. I don't know if that does that. No, well, here's yeah. the thing. If I believed, for instance, that the world was run by these deep state pedophiles, satanic pedophiles who deliberately stole an election and persecuted a guy unjustifiably, entirely unjustifiably, I would have been at the January 6th riots right I, i'd have been pissed off but because, because i don't buy mm -hmm. it it just doesn't have that power over me i think trump is dangerous i don't think he's adolf hitler you, you know i think that democrats are, have a lot of socialist rhetoric i don't think by and large they're actual socialists and I, but if yeah. i did then my interpretation of things in my reaction to things would be much different Right. But so what's the difference? I mean, what, how do we, why are we hanging back? Like, or, and, uh, I don't know what, what what's the methodology for, uh, I, I don't making know. Making sure that's possible. I, because I, you know, I committed to, to reason as uh, my only, uh, method of trying to gather information. When I'm emotional about something, I challenge it. And I will, or if a thought comes into my head, I don't just accept that the thought is true. If I see a guy walking down the street and I say to myself, boy, that guy looks like a jerk. I don't then assume, yes, that guy's a jerk. I understand that there's automatic thoughts that pop into my head that might not correspond to reality, but a lot of people don't seem to do that. They don't question their own thought processes. They don't question their own conclusions. They don't question their emotions. And I mean, I don't know how to, I, well, you can't make people do it. They just have to want to do it. And you know, I, I don't know. I mean, I, like I, something that yeah. hit, baffles me completely about myself is I've never been a cigarette smoker. My parents okay. were both cigarette smokers. Almost all my friends were cigarette smokers. It wasn't as if I had an aversion to doing drugs and drinking because I did plenty of that. I committed plenty of crimes. I just didn't smoke. And I mean- I used to say, oh, I'm not going to be a smoker. It's horrible for you. But given the amount of things I did that were horrible for me, it, it just doesn't hold water. I don't know why. 
I, 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 it, that's something that baffles me. And I don't know exactly how analogous that is to situations where mm. the intention is to draw good conclusions and to weigh on evidence, but it, it weighs on the, the, the uh, what's the word I'm looking for? It's sort of the pivot point of choice as w- why does somebody decide to actually take the steps to evaluate and to think rather than just be emotionally influenced. And I don't know the answer to that. I guess I tend to think that the emotional and the rational have to be integrated in some way uh, for us as believers. You know what I mean? Uh, I do have these visceral responses and I, I want to doubt them, but I don't want to doubt them all simultaneously every time. Like when I have like a terrible moral repugnance for, you know, say what's going on in Gaza or something like that, you know, like the emotional engagement has to bear, I think, in some way on the rational assessment of that policy. But keeping those things in any kind of decent relation or whatever, uh, I guess I, I've i made some pretty bad mistakes along those lines, I think, probably. For example, I kind of I resisted climate change. Uh, or I resisted squarely believing in human caused climate change for a way too long. Uh, and I mean, there's various reasons I didn't want to believe it, you know, or various reasons I was polarized against the kind of people who did believe it sure. or, you know, various, you know, on reflection or even various reasons I doubted some of the scientific results or reported scientific results that it, it may have been rational to doubt at, at times, you know? Uh, but I think also like looking back on it, I see my own reasoning as motivated in a way that disturbs me a little bit and makes me wonder whether what I'm doing now is okay or not. Mm-hmm. But that's the kind of process that you've got to engage in, right? Too to, to, sure. You know, try like, where have I gone wrong with this? You know, you know, I, you touched on something there and I, I'm really enjoying this conversation because it, it it sort of spreads tentacles all over the place. But I think a big problem is where people won't accept there's things that they just don't know. I know virtually nothing about climate change. I mean, I know the basics, you know, the heat getting trapped in the atmosphere, heats everything up. If, you know, if the temperature rises, you, you know, you end up with wildfires, the trees dis- disappear, the oceans rise. I get that stuff. But I tried to read up on it once on, in an on Encyclopedia Britannica on a computer, and I realized how out of my depth I was. I just don't know. Mm-hmm. Now, I yeah. am very skeptical of ca- catastrophic claims because people that have been claiming c- catastrophes are coming have been wrong so many times. I'm also skeptical yeah. about any government's ability to stop it or whether they're telling the truth, but I don't know. But people will go on either side of this. A guy said to me once, you don't believe there's climate change. And I told him, no, what I'm telling you is I don't know enough to have an intelligent debate. I know that you don't because you don't know enough about it either. You're just saying because you've heard somebody else say that it absolutely is happening and you got to be an idiot to deny it. So now you're saying you're an idiot to deny it, but you can't explain this to me. And it's a similar thing with, I I listened to a debate yesterday between Matt Ridley and I I can't remember who the other guy was. And it was about the origins of COVID. Now I've interviewed on this podcast, a scientific journalist on COVID. I lived through COVID. I followed it a little bit. And I listened to this debate from two very intelligent men on different sides of the argument or what the origins were. And by the end, I still have no clue because I just don't know. Yeah. I, I'm not a microbiologist. I don't know how to assess there. You know, there's 30, 40 claims that are made in the course of this argument. And I don't have the wherewithal to assess all that. But there's people right. out Raven, there who yeah. are absolutely convinced they know that it, it it didn't originate in a lab or they know it did and they don't have any more understanding than I did. They just don't recognize <laughs> that they don't have the understanding. Yeah, that's true. Uh, yeah. And I guess I would have said quite what you said for a long time about climate change. It wasn't that I was sitting there denying it was happening. I was saying like, I'm not sure it's happening. And I think that someone like Al Gore is actually very motivated. He wants a kind of world government. He wants some kind of world regulatory regime 
And uh, like, it's, is this supposed to be a coincidence that this serves all his kind of uh, political yeah. agenda at yeah. the same time? But okay. So I, I did a lot of distance tonight, and I'm definitely not in a position to assess the science, not at all. Okay. Um, and, and the COVID case, I think the only rational position now is to suspend, suspend judgment on this. Okay. Like I don't, I, but I guess the, the, the balance of expert opinion, uh, you know, hammering at me long enough and also firsthand experience of the fact that spring is coming earlier that, you know, uh, I mean, I see it in the vegetation in the mid Atlantic and stuff like this. I feel like I'm feeling it. So like, I just, so in one way or another, I, I slowly became convinced, you know, mm -hmm. um, and relatively certain, I guess, as these things go, you know, uh, and so then I started worrying about, so I accused Al Gore of motivated reasoning, right? And then I started reflecting, like, maybe I had that too. Like, okay, so I have a libertarian or anarchist or anti-authoritarian politics, and I didn't want to hear what Al Gore was saying. You know what I mean? Like, because that fucked up my politics. Mm -hmm. And I didn't know that quite about myself, actually. I thought it about Gore. Like, he's so motivated. And, he, you know, he was. Like, but that doesn't mean he's – that doesn't entail that no. what he's saying is false, actually, sadly. No. Uh yeah. So anyway, I don't know how we're where we're no, getting with this. Well, but, the, the, uh, well, the, bunch of stuff to think about. No, it, well, I think it it's all relevant because it stems from the the psychological reactions to the image and how we assess things and how we think about things and how we're influenced by things. So I think that it's in that sense that the entire discussion is relevant because I think it's important that we engage in a rational process that we understand what we know, what we don't know, what we're not capable of knowing. I mean, to learn, for instance, just to go back to COVID, the level of knowledge that Matt Ridley and this other guy had in order to have this debate, where they're both seem to be experts to me, and they disagree, but to gain that would take years of study, right? Yeah. And sure. for guys, like there's, there was a meme that I really, speaking of symbolic images, that I, I found very funny the other day, it was a guy and he was reading his paper and he says, okay, I'm done being an expert on COVID. Now I'm an expert on ballistics. <laughs> like, because people <laughs> so rapidly, they're like, oh no, no, that this, this isn't the case. And I'm just like, how, how do you know that? And I think that when you have a mind that doesn't just accept things or jump to conclusions or think you have full knowledge right away, that these images are going to have less sway because you understand that it doesn't, it's not capable of providing me with the level of information that the emotional reaction I'm having it might intimate. Yeah. And, you know, it might be that I, I, we're sort of experimenting with this that images have oh. certain pointed irrational effects under certain, but, you know, then we could talk about like rational and irrational uses of images. Sure. Because, I mean, if you want to find out what happened, what happened in, in Pennsylvania when Trump got shot, those images have a completely rational, informative content, right? Like there's a, there are ra completely rational uses of those images where you're not gasping. You're thinking like, okay, now I know what happened, you know, uh, or scientific uh, images or whatever. So, you know, I, I guess I just want to resist, though, the idea that images are always irrational in their effects and maybe text is is usually more rational or something like that. Uh, I, I emphasize like there, there's good uses of images and, uh, you know, even of that of that image, of course. Sure, sure. You know, I yeah. wonder, you know, before we, we wrap up, how how differently would people's interpretation of that image? Now, let me say clearly, I'm not saying this happened. It's a, a hypothetical, just to make a point. If it were to come out that when Trump went down, one of the Secret Service members whispered to him, listen, get up, raise your hand above your head and yell fight. How different would be the interpretation? And the, the reason I use that as the example is because we don't know all the facts. And to and, and that's where images, I think, are dangerous. When we think we understand all the facts, 
based on the brief information that we've been given in this very powerful image. Because there's things that could come to light that would drastically alter what we thought about it. If it came out, for instance, that that Trump was in complete shock and was just, you know, uh, fight. That, right. You know, if something neurological went wrong. I mean, there's all types of things. And I'm not saying that happened. I'm just saying if it right did, or if he, it would alter it. Say 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 his ear got cut by a secret agent's cufflink or something like that. Sure. Right. It, not not nicked by a bullet right. at all. Then, then it changes. You know. Then, then it changes. Yeah. And that's and, and that's and and all that's compatible with the image we see. Sure. And it's just, a, you know, and, and again, I, I, you're not I know you're not saying that's what happened. The point is, is that we don't have all the facts yet. We certainly didn't have all the facts in the first 24 hours when people were going gaga over this thing. And it's just wise when assessing an image or a communication or anything to actually get the evidence that's necessary in order to draw conclusions and then do so. Agreed. All right. Beautiful. Okay. Crispin, where can people find you? I found you at Reason Magazine. Yeah. Uh, well, I'm on Twitter all the time uh at crispin sartwell um i guess i do a lot of that uh crispin sartwell at gmail.com as well you can awesome. find me awesome. i no longer have i no longer check my dickinson edu address <laughs> or very rarely okay so. well listen thank you so much it was a, a great conversation i enjoyed it michael thanks All right. for now this is the rational egoist signing out i'm michael Leibowitz. till next time